Chapter 18 of Chico the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 18 Brother Gorenflo. To the beautiful day had succeeded a beautiful evening, only as the day had been cold, the evening was still colder. It was one of those frosts which make the lights in the windows of an hotel look doubly tempting. Chico first entered the dining room and looked around him, but not finding there the man he sought for, went familiarly down to the kitchen. The master of the establishment was superintending a frying pan full of whitings. At the sound of Chicot's step he turned. "'Ah, it is you, monsieur,' said he. "'Good evening and a good appetite to you.' "'Thanks for the wish, but you know I cannot bear to eat alone.' "'If necessary, monsieur, I will sup with you.' thanks my dear host but though i know you to be an excellent companion i seek for someone else brother gorenflot perhaps just so has he begun supper no not yet but you must make haste nevertheless for in five minutes he will have finished monsieur cried chicot striking his head monsieur it is friday and the beginning of lent well and what then said Chicot, who did not hold a high opinion of Gorenflot's religious austerity. Boutromet shrugged his shoulders. "'Decidedly, something must be wrong,' said Chicot. Five minutes for Gorenflot's supper. I am destined to see wonders to-day.' Chicot then advanced toward a small private room, pushed open the door, and saw within the worthy monk, who was turning negligently on his plate a small portion of spinach which he tried to render more savory by the introduction into it of some cheese. Brother Gorenflot was about thirty-eight years of age and five feet high. However, what he wanted in height he made up in breadth, measuring nearly three feet in diameter from shoulder to shoulder, which, as everyone knows, is equal to nine feet of circumference. Between these Herculean shoulders rose a neck of which the muscles stood out like cords. Unluckily, this neck partook of the same proportions, it was short and thick, which at any great emotion might render Brother Gorenflot liable to apoplexy. But knowing this, perhaps, he never gave way to emotions, and was seldom so disturbed as he was when Chicot entered his room. "'Ah, my friend! What are you doing?' cried Chicot, looking at the vegetables and at a glass filled with water, just colored with a few drops of wine. "'You see, my brother, I sup,' replied Gorenflot in a powerful voice. You call that supper, Gorenflot? Herbs and cheese? We are in the beginning of Lent, brother. We must think of our souls, replied Gorenflot, raising his eyes to heaven. Chicot looked astounded. He had so often seen Gorenflot feast in a different manner during Lent. Our souls, said he, and what the devil have herbs and water to do with them? We are forbidden to eat meat on Wednesdays and Fridays. But when did you breakfast? I have not breakfasted, my brother, said the monk. Not breakfasted? Then what have you done? Composed a discourse, said Gorenflot proudly. A discourse? And what for? To deliver this evening at the abbey. That is odd. And I must be quick and go there, or perhaps my audience will grow impatient. Chico thought of the infinite number of monks he had seen going to the abbey, and wondered why Gorenflot, whom certainly he had never thought eloquent, had been chosen to preach before Monsieur de Mayenne and the numerous assemblage. "'When are you to preach?' said he. "'At half-past nine. "'Good. It is still a quarter to nine, and you can give me a few minutes. Ventre de biche! We have not dined together for a week.' "'It is not our fault.' but I know that your duties keep you near our King Henry the Third, while my duties fill up my time. Yes, but it seems to me that is so much the more reason why we should be merry when we do meet. Yes, and I am merry, said Gorenflot, with a piteous look, but still I must leave you. At least finish your supper. Gorenflot looked at the spinach and sighed, then at the water and turned away his head. Do you remember, said Chicot, the little dinner at the Port Montmartre, where, while the king was scourging himself and others, we devoured a teal from the marshes of the Grange Batelier, with a sauce made with crabs, and we drank that nice burgundy wine, what do you call it? 
It is a wine from my country, La Romaine. Yes, yes, it was the milk you sucked as a baby, worthy son of Noah. It was good, said Gorenflot, but there is better. So says Claude Boutremet, who pretends that he has in his cellar fifty bottles to which that is paltry. It is true. True, and yet you drink that abominable red water. Fie! And Chicot, taking the glass, threw the contents out the window. There is a time for all, my brother, said Gorenflot, and wine is good when one has only to praise God after it, but water is better when one has a discourse to pronounce. Opinions differ, for I, who have also a discourse to pronounce, am going to ask for a bottle of Romanet. What do you advise me to take with it, Gorenflot? Not these herbs. They are not nice. Chicot, seizing the plate, threw it after the water and then cried, Maitre Claude! The host appeared. Monsieur Claude, bring me two bottles of your Romanet, which you call so good. Why two bottles? said Gorenflot, as I do not drink it. Oh, if you did, I would have four or six, but if I drink alone, two will do for me. Indeed, two bottles are reasonable, and if you eat no meat with it, your confessor will have nothing to reproach you with. Oh, of course not. Meat on a Friday in Lent. And going to the larder, he drew out a fine capon. What are you doing, brother? said Gorenflot, following his movements with interest. You see, I am taking this carp. Carp? cried Gorenflot. Yes, a carp, said Chicot, showing him the tempting bird. And since when has a carp had a beak? A beak? Do you see a beak? I only see a nose. And wings? Fins. Feathers? Scales, my dear Gorenflot, you are drunk. Drunk? I, who have only eaten spinach and drunk water. Well, your spinach has overloaded your stomach, and your water has mounted to your head. Parbleu! Here is our host. He shall decide. So be it. But first let him uncork the wine. Monsieur Boutremet uncorked a bottle and gave a glass to Chicot. Chicot swallowed and smacked his lips. Ah, said he, I have a bad memory. I cannot remember if it be better or worse than that of Montmartre. Here, my brother, enlighten me, said he, giving a little to the monk who was looking on with eager eyes. Gorenflot took the glass and drank slowly the liquor it contained. It is the same wine, said he, but I had too little to tell whether it be better or worse. But I want to know, and if you had not a sermon to preach, I would beg you to drink a little more. If it will give you pleasure, my brother. Chicot half filled the monk's glass. Gornflow drank it with great gravity. I pronounce it better, said he. You flatter our host. A good drinker ought, at the first draft, to recognize the wine, at the second the quality, and at the third the age. Oh, I should like to know the age of this wine. Give me a few more drops, and I will tell you. Chicot filled his glass, he drank it off, and then said, Fifteen sixty-one. Right, cried Claude Boutremet, it was fifteen sixty-one. Brother Gornflow, cried Chicot, they have beautified men at Rome who were worth less than you. A little habit, said Gorenflot modestly. A talent, for I flatter myself I have the habit, and I could not do it. But what are you about? Going to my assembly. Without eating a piece of my carp? Ah, I true, you know still less of eating than drinking. Monsieur Boutremet, what is the name of this animal? The innkeeper looked astonished. A capon, said he. A capon? cried Chicot with an air of consternation. Yes, and a fine one. Well, said Gorenflot triumphantly. Well, it seems I was wrong, but as I wish to eat this capon and yet not sin, be so kind, brother, as to throw a few drops of water upon it and christen it a carp. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes, I pray you, save me from mortal sin. So be it, cried Gorenflot. 
but there is no water. Oh, the intention is in all. Baptize it with wine, my brother. The animal will be less Catholic, but quite as good. And Chico refilled the monk's glass. The first bottle was finished. In the name of Bacchus, Momus, and Comus, Trinity of the great Saint Pantagruel, I baptize thee, Carp, said Gorenflot. Now, said Chico, to the health of the newly baptized. May it be cooked to perfection, and may Monsieur Boutremet add to the excellent qualities which it has received from nature. To his health, cried Gorenflot, interrupting a hearty laugh to swallow his wine. Monsieur Cloud, put this carp at once on the spit, cover it with fresh butter, with shallots in it, and put some toast in the frying pan and serve it hot. Gorenflot approved with a motion of his head. Now, Monsieur Boutremet, some sardines and a tunny fish. Meanwhile, it is Lent, and I wish to make a meager dinner. And let me have two more bottles of wine. The smell of the cookery began to mount to the brain of the monk, yet he made a last effort to rise. Then you leave me after all, said Chicot. I must, said Gorenflot, raising his eyes to heaven. It is very imprudent of you to go to pronounce a discourse fasting. Why? Because your strength will fail you. Galen has said it, Polmo hominis facile defici. Alas, yes. You see, then? Luckily, I have zeal. Ah, but that is not enough. I advise you to eat some sardines, and drink a little of this nectar. A single sardine, then, and one glass. Chico gave him the sardine and passed him the bottle. He himself took care of keeping sober. "'I feel myself less feeble,' said Gorenflot. "'Oh, you must feel quite strong before you go, and so I advise you to eat the fins of the carp.' And as they entered with the poulet, Chico cut off a leg and thigh, which Gorenflot soon dispatched. "'What a delicious fish!' said Gorenflot. Chico cut off the other leg and gave it to Gorenflot while he ate the wings. "'And famous wine!' said he, uncorking another bottle. Having once commenced, Gorenflot could not stop. His appetite was enormous. He finished the bird and then called to Boutremet. "'Monsieur Claude,' said he, "'I am hungry. Did you not offer me omelette just now?' "'Certainly.' "'Well, bring it.' "'In five minutes.' "'Ah!' said Gorenflot. Now I feel in force. If the omelet were here, I could eat it at a mouthful, and I could swallow this wine at a gulp. And he swallowed a quarter of the third bottle. Ah, if you were ill before. I was foolish, friend. That cursed discourse weighed on my mind. I have been thinking of it for days. It ought to be magnificent. Splendid. Tell me some of it while we wait for the omelet. No, no, not a sermon at table. We have beautiful discourses at the court, I assure you. About what? About virtue. Ah, yes, he is a very virtuous man, our King Henry the Third. I do not know if he be virtuous, but I know that I have never seen anything there to make me blush. You blush? At this moment, Monsieur Boutromet entered with the omelette and two more bottles. "'Bring it here!' cried the monk, with a smile which showed his thirty-two teeth. "'But, friend, I thought you had a discourse to pronounce.' "'It is here!' cried Gorenflot, striking his forehead. "'At half-past nine? "'I lied. It was ten. Ten? I thought the abbey shut at nine. "'Let it shut. I have a key.' "'A key of the abbey?' "'Here in my pocket.' impossible i know the monastic rules they would not give the key to a simple monk here it is said gorenflot showing a piece of money oh money you corrupt the porter to go in when you please wretched sinner but what strange money an effigy of the heretic with a hole through his heart yes i see it as a tester of the baron kings and here is a hole a blow with a dagger. Death to the heretic. He who does it is sure of paradise. He is not yet drunk enough, so thought Chicot, 
and he filled his glass again. "'To the mass!' cried Gorenflow, drinking it off. Chico remembered the porter looking at the hands of the monks and said, "'Then if you can show this to the porter—' "'I enter.' "'Without difficulty?' "'As this wine into my stomach.' And the monk absorbed a new dose. "'And you pronounce your discourse?' "'And I pronounce my discourse. I arrive. Do you hear? The assembly is numerous and select. There are barons, counts, and dukes.' "'And even princes?' "'And even princes. I enter humbly among the faithful of the Union.' the union what does that mean i enter they call brother gorenflow and i advance at these words the monk rose and i advance continued he trying to do so but at the first step he rolled on to the floor bravo cried chicot you advance you salute the audience and say no it is my friends who say brother gorenflot a fine name for a leaguer is it not a leaguer thought chicot what truths is this wine going to bring out then i begin and the monk rose and leaned against the wall you begin said chicot holding him up i begin my brothers it is a good day for the faith a very good day my brothers it is a very good day for the faith after this as chicot loosed his hold gorenflot fell full length again on the floor and before many minutes a loud snoring was heard. Good, said Chicot. He is in for twelve hours sleep. I can easily undress him. He then untied the monk's robe and pulled it off. Then rolled Gorenflow in the tablecloth and covered his head with a napkin and, hiding the monk's frock under his cloak, passed into the kitchen. Monsieur Boutromet, said he, here is for our supper and for my horse, and pray, do not wake the worthy brother Gorenflow who sleeps sound. No, no, be easy, Monsieur Chicot. Then Chicot ran to the Rue Saint Etienne, put on the monk's robe, took the tester in his hand, and at a quarter to ten presented himself, not without a beating heart, at the wicket of the Abbey Saint Genevieve. End of chapter eighteen. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 19 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 19 How Chicot Found Out That It Was Easier to Go In Than Out of the Abbey. Chicot, from the cloak and other things under the monk's robe, looked much larger across the shoulders than usual. His beard was of the same color of Gorenflos and he had so often amused himself with mimicking the monk's voice and manner of speaking that he could do it perfectly. Now everyone knows that the beard and the voice are the only things which are recognizable from under the depths of a monk's hood. Chicot exhibited his coin and was admitted without difficulty, and then followed two other monks to the chapel of the convent. In this chapel, built in the eleventh century, the choir was raised nine or ten feet above the rest of the building and you mounted into it by two lateral staircases while an iron door between them led from the nave to the crypt, into which you had to descend again. In this choir there was a portrait of St. Genevieve, and on each side of the altar were statues of Clovis and Clotilda. Three lamps only lighted the chapel, and the imperfect light gave a greater solemnity to the scene. Chico was glad to find that he was not the last, for three monks entered after in grey robes, and placed themselves in front of the altar. Soon after, a little monk, doubtless a lad belonging to the choir, came and spoke to one of these monks, who then said aloud, We are now one hundred and thirty-six. Then a great noise of bolts and bars announced that the door was being closed. The three monks were seated in armchairs like judges. The one who had spoken before now rose and said, Brother Monsoreau, what news do you bring to the Union from the province of Anjou? Two things made Chico start. The first was the voice of the speaker, the second the name of Montserrat, known to the court only the last few days. A tall monk crossed the assembly and placed himself in a large chair, behind the shadow of which Chico had kept himself. 
My brothers, said a voice which Chicot recognized at once as that of the chief huntsman, the news from Anjou is not satisfactory. Not that we fail there in sympathy, but in representatives. The progress of the union there had been confided to the Baron de Matador, but he, in despair at the recent death of his daughter, has in his grief neglected the affairs of the League, and we cannot at present count on him. As for myself, I bring three new adherents to the association. The council must judge whether these three, for whom I answer, as for myself, ought to be admitted into the union. A murmur of applause followed, and as Montereau regained his seat, "'Brother La Hurriere, cried the same monk, "'tell us what you have done in the city of Paris.' A man now took the chair and said, "'My brothers, you know I am devoted to the Catholic faith, "'and I have given proofs of this devotion on the great day of its triumph. "'Yes, my brothers, I glory in saying that I was one of the faithful "'of our great Henry de Guise, and that I followed his orders strictly. "'I have now noted all the heretics of the courtier saint germain Lacerat, "'where I shall hold the Hotel of the Belle Etoile at your service, my brothers. "'Now, although I no longer thirst for the blood of heretics as formerly, "'I do not delude myself as to the real object of the Holy Union which we are forming. "'If I am not deceived, brothers, the extinction of private heretics is not all we aim at. "'We wish to be sure that we shall never be governed by a heretic prince. "'Now, my friends, what is our situation? "'Charles the Ninth, who was zealous,' died without children. Henry the Third will probably do the same, and there remains only the Duc d'Anjou, who not only has no children either, but seems cold towards us. "'What makes you accuse the prince thus?' said the monk, who always spoke. "'Because he has not joined us.' "'Who tells you so, since there are new adherents?' "'It is true. I will wait, but after him, who is mortal and has no children, to whom will the crown fall? To the most ferocious Huguenot that can be imagined? To a renegade? A Nebuchadnezzar? Here the acclamations were tremendous. To Henry of Béarn, continued he, against whom this association is chiefly directed, to Henry, who the people at Pau or Tarbes think is occupied with his love affairs, but who is in Paris? In Paris! Impossible! cried many voices. He was here on the night when Madame de Sauve was assassinated, and perhaps is here still. "'Death to the Bernays!' cried several. "'Yes, doubtless, and if he came to lodge at the Belle Etoile, I answer for him. But he will not come. One does not catch a fox twice in the same hole. He will lodge with some friend, for he has friends. The important thing is to know them. Our union is holy, our league is loyal, consecrated and blessed by the Pope.' Therefore I demand that it be no longer kept secret, but that we go into the houses and canvass the citizens. Those who sign will be our friends, the others our enemies, and if a second St. Bartholomew come, which seems to the faithful to be more necessary daily, we shall know how to separate the good from the wicked. Thunders of acclamation followed. When they were calm, the monk who always spoke said, the proposition of Brother La Hurriera, whom the Union thanks for his zeal, will be taken into consideration by the Superior Council. La Hurriera bowed, amidst fresh applause. Aha, thought Chicot, I begin to see clearly into all this. The Guises are forming a nice little party, and some fine morning Henry will find that he has nothing left, and will be politely invited to enter a monastery. But what will they do with the Duc d'Anjou? "'Brother Gorenflot,' then cried the monk. No one replied. "'Brother Gorenflot,' cried the little monk in a voice which made Chicot start, for it sounded like a woman's. However, he rose, and speaking like the monk, said, "'Here I am. I was plunged in profound meditation.' He feared not to reply, for the members had been counted, and therefore the absence of a member would have provoked an examination. Therefore, without hesitation, he mounted the chair and began." my brothers you know that i purvey for the convent and have the right of entering every dwelling i use this privilege for the good of religion my brothers continued he remembering glorenfo's beginning this day which unites us is a good one for the faith let us speak freely my brothers since we are in the house of god what is the kingdom of france a body omnis cavitas corpus est 
What is the first requisite of a body? Good health. How do we preserve this? By prudent bleedings at times. Now it is evident that the enemies of our religion are too strong. We must therefore once more bleed that great body we call society. This is what is constantly said to me by the faithful who give me ham, eggs, or money for the convent. Several murmurs of approbation interrupted Chicot, then he went on. Some may object that the church abhors blood, but they do not say what blood, and I wager that it is not the blood of heretics it abhors. And then another argument, I said the church. But are we the church? Brother Monsoreau, who spoke so well just now, has, I doubt not, his huntsman's knife in his belt. Brother La Herdiera manages the spit. I, myself, who speak to you, I, Jacques Gornflow, have carried the musket in Champagne. It now remains to us to speak of our chiefs, of whom it seems to me, poor monk as I am, that there is something to say. Certainly it is very well and prudent to come at night under a monk's robe to hear Brother Gornflow preach, but it appears to me that their duties do not stop there. So much prudence may make the Huguenots laugh. Let us play a part more worthy of the brave people we are. What do we want? The extinction of heresy. Well, that may be cried from the housetops, it seems to me. Why not march in holy procession, displaying our good cause and our good partisans, but not like the thieves who keep looking around them to see if the watch is coming? Who is the man who will set the example? Well, it is I, Jacques Gornflow, I, unworthy brother of the Order of St. Genevieve, poor and humble purveyor of the convent. It shall be I, who, with a cuirass on my back, a helmet on my head, and a musket on my shoulder, will march at the head of all good Catholics who will follow me. This I would do, were it only to make those chiefs blush, who, while defending the church, hide as if their cause was a bad one. This speech, which corresponded with the sentiments of many there, was received with shouts of applause, and the more so, as up to this time Gorenflot had never shown any enthusiasm for the cause. However, it was not the plan of the chiefs to let this enthusiasm proceed. One of the monks spoke to the lad, who cried in his silvery voice, "'My brothers, it is time to retire. The sitting is over.' The monks rose, all determined to insist on the procession at the next meeting. Many approached the chair to felicitate the author of this brilliant speech, but Chicot, fearful of being recognized, threw himself on his knees and buried his head in his hands as if in prayer. They respected his devotions and went towards the door. However, Chicot had missed this chief aim. What had made him quit the king was the sight of Monsieur de Mayenne and Nicolas David, on both of whom he had, as we know, vowed vengeance, and although the duke was too great a man to be attacked openly, Nicolas David was not, and Chicot was so good a swordsman as to feel sure of success if he could but meet him. He therefore began to watch each monk as he went out and perceived, to his terror, that each on going out had to show some sign again. Gorenflow had told him how to get in, but not how to get out again. End of chapter 19 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 20 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 20 how Chicot, forced to remain in the abbey, saw and heard things very dangerous to see and hear. Chicot hastened to get down from his chair and to mix among the monks so as to discover, if possible, what signs they used. By peeping over their shoulders, he found out that it was a farthing with a star cut in the middle. Our Gascon had plenty of farthings in his pocket, but unluckily none with a star in it. Of course, if when on coming to the door he was unable to produce the necessary signs, he would be suspected and examined. He gained the shade of a pillar which stood at the corner of a confessional, and stood there wondering what he should do. An assistant cried, Is everyone out? The doors are about to be shut. No one answered. Chicot peeped out and saw the chapel empty, with the exception of the three monks who still kept their seats in the front of the choir. Provided they do not shut the windows, it is all I ask, thought Chicot. Let us examine, said the young lad to the porter. Then the porter lifted a taper, and followed by the young lad, began to make the tour of the church. 
There was not a moment to lose. Chicot softly opened the door of the confessional, slipped in, and shut the door after him. They passed close by him, and he could see them through the spaces of the sculpture. Diable, thought he, he cannot stay here all night, and once they are gone I will pile chairs upon benches, Pelion on Osa, and get out of the window. Ah, yes, but when I have done that I shall be not in the street but in the court. I believe it would be better to pass the night in the confessional. Gornflo's robe is warm. Extinguish the lamps now cried the lad and the porter with an immense extinguisher put out the lamps and left the church dark except for the rays of the moon which shone through the windows the clock struck twelve ventre de biche said chicot henry if he were here would be nicely frightened but luckily i am less timid come chicot my friend good night and sleep well then chicot pushed the inside bolt made himself as comfortable as he could and shut his eyes he was just falling asleep when he was startled by a loud stroke on a copper bell and at the same time the lamp in the choir was relighted and showed the three monks still there what can this mean thought chicot starting up brave as he was chicot was not exempt from superstitious fears he made the sign of the cross murmuring vada retro satanas but as the lights did not go out at the holy sign chicot began to think he had to deal with real monks and real lights but at this moment one of the flagstones of the choir raised itself slowly and a monk appeared through an opening after which the stone shut again at this sight chicot's hair stood on end and he began to fear that all the priors and abbes of saint genevieve from opsat dead in five thirty three down to pierre boudin predecessor of the present superior were being resuscitated from their tombs, and were going to raise with their bony heads the stones of the choir. But this doubt did not last long. "'Brother Monsoreau, said one of the monks to him, who had just made so strange an appearance. "'Yes, Monseigneur,' said he. "'Open the door, that he may come to us.' Monsoreau descended to open the door between the staircases, and at the same time the monk in the middle lowered his hood and showed the great scar that noble sign by which the parisians recognized their hero the great henry of guise himself thought chicot whom his very imbecile majesty believes occupied at the siege of la charite ah and he at the right is the cardinal of lorraine and he at the left monsieur de mayenne a trinity not very holy but very visible did you think he would come said le balafre to his brothers I was so sure of it that I have under my cloak wherewith to replace the holy vial. And Chicot perceived by the feeble light of the lamp a silver gilt box richly chased. Then about twenty monks with their heads buried in immense hoods came out of the crypt and stationed themselves in the nave. A single one, conducted by Monsieur de Montsoreau, mounted the staircase and placed himself at the right of Monsieur de Guise. Then Monsieur de Guise spoke. Friends, said he, Time is precious, therefore I go straight to the point. You have heard just now in the first assembly the complaints of some of our members, who tax with coldness the principal person among us, the prince nearest the throne. The time has come to render justice to this prince. You shall hear and judge for yourselves whether your chiefs merit the reproach of coldness and apathy made by one of our brothers, the monk Gorenflo, whom we have not judged it prudent to admit into our secret." At this name, pronounced in a tone which showed bad intentions toward the warlike monk, Chicot and his confessional could not help laughing quietly. Monsieur, said the duke, now turning towards the mysterious personages at his right, the will of God appears to me manifest, for since you have consented to join us, it shows that what we do is well done. Now, your highness, we beg of you to lower your hood that your faithful friends may see with their own eyes that you keep the promise which I made in your name, and which they hardly dared to believe. The mysterious personage now lowered his hood, and Chicot saw the head of the Duc d'Anjou appear, so pale that by the light of the lamp it looked like that of a marble statue. Oh, oh, thought Chicot, the Duke is not yet tired of playing for the crown with the heads of others. Long live Monsieur le Duc d'Anjou, cried the assembly. The Duke grew paler than ever. Fear nothing, Monseigneur, said Henry de Guise. 
our chapel is deaf and its doors are well closed my brothers said the comte de montsoreau his highness wishes to address a few words to the assembly yes yes cried they gentlemen began he in a voice so trembling that at first they could hardly distinguish his words i believe that god who often seems insensible and deaf to the things of this world keeps on the contrary his piercing eyes constantly on us and only remains thus careless in appearance in order to remedy by some great blow the disorders caused by the foolish ambitions of men i also have kept my eyes if not on the world at least on france what have i seen there the holy religion of christ shaken to its foundation by those who sap all belief under the pretext of drawing nearer to god and my soul has been full of grief in the midst of this grief i heard that several noble and pious gentlemen friends of our old faith were trying to strengthen the tottering altar i threw my eyes around me and saw on one side the heretics from whom i recoiled with horror on the other side the elect and i am come to throw myself into their arms my brothers here i am the applause and bravos resounded through the chapel then the cardinal turning to the duke said you are amongst us of your own free will of my free will monsieur who instructed you in the holy mystery my friend the comte de montsoreau a man zealous for religion then said the duc de guise as your highness has joined us have the goodness to tell us what you intend to do for the league i intend to serve the catholic religion in all its extent entre de biche thought chicot why not propose this right out to the king it would suit him excellently processions macerations extirpation of heresy faggots and auto de fe go on worthy brother his majesty noble imbecile go on and the duke as if sensible of the encouragement proceeded but the interests of religion are not the sole aim which you gentlemen propose as for me i see another for when a gentleman has thought of what he owes to god he thinks of his country and he asks himself if it really enjoys all the honor and prosperity which it ought to enjoy i ask this about our france and i see with grief that it does not indeed the state is torn to pieces by different wills and tastes one as powerful as the other it is i fear to the feebleness of the head which forgets that it ought to govern all for the good of its subjects or only remembers this royal principle at capricious intervals when the rare acts of energy are generally not for the good but the ill of france that we must attribute these evils whatever be the cause the ill is a real one although i accuse certain false friends of the king rather than the king himself therefore i join myself to those who by all means seek the extinction of heresy and the ruin of perfidious counsellors this discourse appeared profoundly to interest the audience who throwing back their hoods drew near to the duke monseigneur said the duc de guise in thanking your royal highness for the words you have just uttered i will add that you are surrounded by people devoted not only to the principles which you profess but to the person of your highness and if you have any doubt the conclusion of this sitting will convince you monseigneur said the cardinal if your highness still experiences any fear the names of those who now surround you will i hope reassure you here is monsieur le gouverneur d'orny monsieur d'antragues monsieur de ribeirac and monsieur de Livarot, and gentlemen whom your highness doubtless knows to be as brave as loyal here are besides monsieur de castillon monsieur le baron de lusignan monsieurs uh, cruchet and leclerc all ready to march under the guidance of your highness to the emancipation of religion and the throne we shall then receive with gratitude the orders that you will give us then monsieur de mayenne said you are by your birth and by your wisdom monseigneur the natural chief of the holy union and we ought to learn from you what our conduct should be with regard to the false friends of his majesty of whom you just now spoke nothing more simple replied the prince with that feverish excitement which in weak natures supplies the place of courage to weak minds when venomous plants grow in a field we root them up the king is surrounded not with friends but with courtiers who ruin him and cause a perpetual scandal in france and all christendom it is true 
said the Duc de Guise in a gloomy tone. And, said the cardinal, these courtiers prevent us, who are his majesty's true friends, from approaching him, as we have the right to do by our birth and position. Let us then, said Monsieur de Mayenne, leave the heretics to the vulgar leaguers. Let us think of those who annoy and insult us, and who often fail in respect to the prince whom we honor, and who is our chief. The Duc d'Anjou grew red. Let us destroy, continued Mien, to the last man, the cursed race whom the king enriches, and let each of us charge ourselves with the life of one. We are thirty here. Let us count. I, said D'Antragues, charge myself with Quellus. I, with Maugiron, said Livarot, and I, with Schomberg, said Ribarac. Good, said the Duke, and there is Bussy, my brave Bussy, who will undertake some of them. And us, cried the rest. Monsieur de Montsoreau now advanced. Gentlemen, said he, I claim an instant silence. We are resolute men, and yet we fear to speak freely to each other. We are intelligent men, and yet we are deterred by foolish scruples. Come, gentlemen, a little courage, a little hardihood, a little frankness. It is not of the king's minions that we think. There does not lie our difficulty. What we really complain of is the royalty which we are under and which is not acceptable to a French nobility, prayers and despotism, weakness and orgies, prodigality for fetes which make all Europe laugh, and parsimony for everything that regards the state and the arts. Such conduct is not weakness or ignorance, it is madness. A dead silence followed this speech. Everyone trembled at the words which echoed his own thoughts. Monsieur de Montsoreau went on. Must we live under a king, foolish, inert, and lazy, at a time when all other nations are active and work gloriously while we sleep? Gentlemen, pardon me for saying before a prince who will perhaps blame my temerity, for he has the prejudices of family, that for four years we have been governed not by a king but by a monk. At these words the explosion so skillfully prepared, and as skillfully kept in check, burst out with violence. Down with the Valois, they cried. Down with Brother Henry. Let us have for chief a gentleman, a knight, rather a tyrant than a monk. Gentlemen, cried the Duke d'Anjou hypocritically, let me plead for my brother who is led away. Let me hope that our wise remonstrances, that the efficacious intervention of the power of the League, will bring him back into the right path. Hiss, serpent, hiss said Chicot to himself. Monseigneur, replied the Duc de Guise, your highness has heard perhaps rather too soon, but still you have heard the true meaning of the association. No, we are not really thinking of a league against the Béarnais, nor of a league to support the church, which will support itself. No, we think of raising the nobility of France from its abject condition. Too long we have been kept back by the respect we feel for your highness, by the love which we know you to have for your family. Now all is revealed, Monseigneur, and your highness will assist at the true sitting of the League. All that has passed is but preamble. "'What do you mean, Monsieur le Duc?' asked the prince, his heart beating at once with alarm and ambition. "'Monseigneur, we are united here not only to talk, but to act. Today we choose a chief capable of honoring and enriching the nobility of France.' And as it was the custom of the ancient Franks, when they chose a chief to give him a present worthy of him, we offer a present to the chief whom we have chosen. All hearts beat, and that of the prince most of any. Yet he remained mute and motionless, betraying his emotion only by his paleness. Gentlemen, continued the duke, taking something from behind him, here is the present that in your name I place at the feet of the prince. A crown! cried the prince, scarcely able to stand. A crown to me? Gentlemen! Long live Francois the Third! cried all the gentlemen, drawing their swords. Ah, uh, I? cried the duke, trembling with terror and joy. It is impossible. My brother still lives. He is the anointed of the Lord. We depose him, said the duke, waiting for the time when God shall sanction by his death the election which we are about to make or rather till one of his subjects, tired of this inglorious reign, forestalls by poison, or the dagger the justice of God. Gentlemen, said the duke feebly. Monseigneur, then said the cardinal, 
to the scruple which you so nobly expressed just now. This is our answer. Henry the Third was the anointed of the Lord, but we have deposed him. It is you who are going to be so. Here is a temple as venerable as that of Reims, for here have reposed the relics of St. Genevieve, patroness of Paris. Here has been embalmed the body of Clovis, our first Christian king. Well, Monseigneur, in this holy temple, I, one of the princes of the church, and who may reasonably hope to become one day its head, I tell you, Monseigneur, that here, to replace the holy oil, is an oil sent by Pope Gregory the Eighth. Monseigneur, name your future Archbishop of Reims, name your constable, and in an instant it is you who will be king, and your brother Henry, if he do not give you up the crown, will be the usurper. Child, light the altar. Immediately the lad, who was evidently waiting, came out, and presently fifty lights shone round the altar and choir. Then was seen on the altar a mitre glittering with precious stones and a large sword ornamented with fleur-de-lis. It was the archbishop's mitre and the constable's sword. At the same moment the organ began to play the Veni Creator. This sudden stroke, managed by the three Lorraine princes, and which the Duc d'Anjou himself did not expect, made a profound impression on the spectators. The courageous grew bolder than ever, the weak grew strong. The Duc d'Anjou raised his head and, with a firmer step than might have been expected, walked to the altar, took the mitre in the left hand and the sword in the right, presented one to the cardinal and the other to the duke. Unanimous applause followed this action. "'Now, gentlemen,' said the prince to the others, "'give your names to Monsieur de Mayenne, Grand Master of France, and the day when I ascend the throne you shall have the cordon bleu.' "'My dear,' thought Chicot, "'what a pity I cannot give mine.' I shall never have such another opportunity. Now to the altar, sire, said the cardinal. Monsieur de Monsoreau, my colonel, Monsieurs de Ribarac and d'Antragues, my captains, and Monsieur Levaro, my lieutenant of the guards, take your places. Each of those named took the post which, at a real coronation, etiquette would have assigned to them. Meanwhile the cardinal had passed behind the altar to put on his pontifical robes, Soon he reappeared with the holy vial. Then the lad brought to him a Bible and a cross. The cardinal put the cross on the book and extended them towards the Duc d'Anjou, who put his hands on them and said, In the presence of God, I promise to my people to maintain and honor our holy religion, as a Christian king should, and may God and his saints aid me. Then the Duc de Guise laid the sword before the altar, and the cardinal blessed it and gave it to the prince. Sire, said he, take this sword which is given to you with the blessing of God, that you may resist your enemies and protect and defend the holy church which is confided to you. Take this sword, that with it you may exercise justice, protect the widow and the orphan, repair disorders, so that covering yourself with glory by all the virtues, you will be a blessing to your people. Then the prince returned the sword to the Duc de Guise and knelt down. The cardinal opened the gold box and with the point of the golden needle, drew out some holy oil. He then said two prayers, and taking the oil on his finger, traced with it a cross on the head of the prince, saying, Ungo dein regem de olio sanctifactico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. The lad wiped off the oil with an embroidered handkerchief. Then the cardinal took the crown, and holding it over the head of the prince, said, God crown thee with the crown of glory and justice. Then placing it, receive this crown in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All brandished their swords and cried, Long live Francois the Third. Sire, said the Cardinal, you reign henceforth over France. Gentlemen, said the Prince, I shall never forget the names of the thirty gentlemen who first judged me worthy to reign over them. And now adieu and may God have you in his holy keeping. The Duke de Mayenne led away the new king, while the other two brothers exchanged an ironical smile. End of chapter 20 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 21 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 21. How Chicot Learned Genealogy. 
When the Duc d'Anjou was gone and had been followed by all the others, the three Guises entered the vestry. Chicot, thinking of course this was the end, got up to stretch his limbs, and then, as it was nearly two o'clock, once more disposed himself to sleep. But to his great astonishment the three brothers almost immediately came back again, only this time without their frocks. On seeing them appear, the lad burst into so hearty a fit of laughing that Chicot could hardly help laughing also. "'Do not laugh so loud, sister,' said the Duc de Mayenne. "'They are hardly gone out and might hear you.' As he spoke, the seeming lad threw back his hood and displayed a head as charming and intelligent as was ever painted by Leonardo da Vinci, black eyes full of fun, but which could assume an expression almost terrible in its seriousness, a little rosy mouth, and a round chin terminating the perfect oval of a rather pale face. It was Madame de Montpensier, a dangerous siren who had the soul of a demon with the face of an angel. "'A brother cardinal,' cried she, "'how well you acted the holy man. I was really afraid for a minute that you were serious. And he, letting himself be greased and crowned, oh, how horrid he looked with his crown on!' "'Never mind,' said the duke. We have got what we wanted, and Francois cannot now deny his share. Monsoreau, who doubtless had his own reasons for it, led the thing on well, and now he cannot abandon us, as he did La Mole and Coquenard. Chicot saw that they had been laughing at Monsieur d'Anjou, and, as he detested him, would willingly have embraced them for it, always accepting Monsieur de Mayenne, and giving his share to his sister. "'Let us return to business,' said the cardinal. "'Is all well closed?' oh yes said the duchess but if you like i will go and see oh no you must be tired no it was too amusing mayenna you say he is here yes i did not see him no he is hidden in a confessional these words startled chicot fearfully then he has heard and seen all asked the duke never mind he is one of us Bring him here, Mayenne. Mayenne descended the staircase and came straight to where Chicot was hiding. He was brave, but now his teeth chattered with terror. Ah, thought he, trying to get out his sword from under his monk's frock, at least I will kill him first. The duke had already extended his hand to open the door when Chicot heard the duchess say, Not there, Mayenne, in that confessional to the left. It was time, thought Chicot as the duke turned away. But who the devil can the other be? Come out, Monsieur David, said Mayenne. We are alone. Here I am, Monseigneur, said he, coming out. You have heard all? asked the Duc de Guise. I have not lost a word, Monseigneur. Then you can report it to the envoy of His Holiness Gregory the Thirteenth. Everything. Now, Mayenne tells me you have done wonders for us. Let us see. I have done what I promised, Monseigneur, that is to say, found a method of seating you without opposition on the throne of France. They also, thought Chicot, everyone wants then to be king of France. Chicot was gay now, for he felt safe once more, and he had discovered a conspiracy by which he hoped to ruin his two enemies. To gain a legitimate right is everything, continued in Nicolas David and I have discovered that you are the true heirs, and the Valois only a usurping branch. It is difficult to believe, said the Duke, that our house, however illustrious it may be, comes before the Valois. It is nevertheless proved, Monseigneur, said David, drawing out a parchment. The Duke took it. What is this? said he. The genealogical tree of the house of Lorraine. Of which the root is... Charlemagne, Monseigneur. Charlemagne? cried the three brothers with an air of incredulous satisfaction. Impossible. Wait, Monseigneur. You may be sure I have not raised a point to which any one may give the lie. What you want is a long lawsuit, during which you can gain over not the people, they are yours, but the Parliament. See, then, Monseigneur, here it is. Ranier, first Duc de Lorraine, a contemporary with Charlemagne, Guibert, his son, Henri, son of Guibert. But, said the duke, a little patience, Monseigneur. Bon. Yes, said the duke, daughter of Richine, second son of Rainier. 
Good. To whom married? Bon? Yes. To Charles of Lorraine, son of Louis the Fourth, King of France? Just so. Now add, brother of Lothair, despoiled of the crown of France by the usurper Hugh Capet. Oh, oh, said the duke and the cardinal. Now Charles of Lorraine inherited from his brother Lothair. Now the race of Lothair is extinct. Therefore, you are the only true heirs of the throne. What do you say to that, brother? cried the cardinal. I say that, unluckily, there exists in France a law they call the Salic Law, which destroys all our pretensions. I expected that objection, Monseigneur, said David, but what is the first example of the Salic Law? The accession of Philippe de Valois to the prejudice of Edward of England. What was the date of that accession? 1328, said the Cardinal. That is to say, three hundred and forty-one years after the usurpation of Hugh Capet, two hundred and forty years after the extinction of the race of Lothair. Then, for two hundred and forty years, your ancestors had already had a right to the throne before the Salic law was invented. Now, everyone knows that the law cannot have any retrospective effect. You are a clever man, Monsieur David, said the Duc de Guise. It is very ingenious, said the Cardinal. It is very fine, said Mayenne. It is admirable, said the Duchess. Then I am a princess royal. I will have no one less than the Emperor of Germany for a husband. Well, here are your two hundred gold crowns which I promised you. And here are two hundred others, said the Cardinal, for the new mission with which we are about to charge you. Speak, Monseigneur, I am ready. We cannot commission you to carry this genealogy yourself to our Holy Father Gregory the Thirteenth. Alas, no, my will is good, but I am of too poor birth. Yes, it is a misfortune. We must therefore send Pierre de Gondy on this mission. Permit me to speak, said the Duchess. The Gondys are clever, no doubt, but ambitious, and not to be trusted. Oh, reassure yourself. Gandhi shall take this, but mixed with other papers and not knowing what he carries. The Pope will approve or disapprove silently, and Gandhi will bring us back the answer, still in ignorance of what he brings. You, Nicolas David, shall wait for him at Chalon, Lyon, or Avignon, according to your instructions. Thus you alone will know our true secret. Then the three brothers shook hands, embraced their sister, put on again their monk's robes, and disappeared. Behind them the porter drew the bolts and then came in and extinguished the lights, and Chicot heard his retreating steps fainter and fainter, and all was silent. It seems now all is really over, thought Chicot, and he came out of the confessional. He had noticed in a corner a ladder destined to clean the windows. He felt about until he found it, for it was close to him, and by the light of the moon placed it against the window. He easily opened it, and striding across it and drawing the ladder to him with that force and address which either fear or joy always gives, he drew it from the inside to the outside. When he had descended, he hid the ladder in a hedge, which was planted at the bottom of the wall, jumped from tomb to tomb until he reached the outside wall over which he clambered. Once in the street, he breathed more freely. He had escaped with a few scratches from the place where he had several times felt his life in danger. He went straight to the corn d'abondance at which he knocked. It was opened by Claude Beautremé himself, who knew him at once, although he went out dressed as a cavalier and returned attired as a monk. "'Ah, is it you?' cried he. Chicot gave him a crown and asked for Gorenflot. The host smiled and said, "'Look!' Brother Gorenflot lay snoring just in the place where Chicot had left him. End of chapter 21 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter Twenty Two of Chico the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Twenty Two How Monsieur and Madame de Saint Luc met with a traveling companion. The next morning, about the time when Gorenflot woke from his nap, warmly rolled in his frock, our reader, if he had been traveling on the road from Paris to Angiers, 
might have seen a gentleman and his page riding quietly side by side. These cavaliers had arrived at Chartres the evening before, with foaming horses, one of which had fallen with fatigue as they stopped. They entered the inn, and half an hour after set out on fresh horses. Once in the country, still bare and cold, the taller of the two approached the other and said as he opened his arms, "'Dear little wife, embrace me, for now we are safe.' Then Madame de St. Luc, leaning forward and opening her thick cloak, placed her arms round the young man's neck and gave him the long and tender kiss which she had asked for. They stayed the night in the little village of Corville, four leagues only from Chartres, but which from its isolation seemed to them a secure retreat, and it was on the following morning that they were, as we had said, pursuing their way. This day, as they were more easy in their minds, they traveled no longer like fugitives, but like schoolboys seeking for moss, for the first few early flowers enjoying the sunshine and amused at everything. "'More bleu!' cried St. Luke at last. "'How delightful it is to be free! Have you ever been free, Jean?' "'I!' cried she, laughing. <laughs> "'Never! It is the first time I ever felt so. My father was suspicious, and my mother lazy. I never went out with uh, without a governess and two lackeys, so that I do not remember having run on the grass since... When a laughing child, I ran in the woods of Meridor with my dear Diana, challenging her to race and rushing through the branches. But you, dear St. Luke, you were free, at least. I, free? Doubtless, a man. Never. Brought up with the Duc d'Anjou, taken by him to Poland, brought back to Paris, condemned never to leave him by the perpetual rule of etiquette pursued if i tried to go away by that doleful voice crying saint luke my friend i am ennuyé come and amuse me free with that stiff corset which strangled me and that great ruff which scratched my neck no i have never been free till now and i enjoy it if they should catch us and send us to the bastille if they only put us there together we can bear it I do not think they would, but there is no fear if you only knew Matador, its great oaks and its endless thickets, its rivers, its lakes, its flower-beds and lawns, and then, in the midst of all, the queen of this kingdom, the beautiful, the good Diana, and I know she loves me still. She is not capricious in her friendships. Think of the happy life we shall lead there. Let us push on. I am in haste to get there and they rode on, stayed the night at Mans, and then set off for Meridor. They had already reached the woods and thought themselves in safety when they saw behind them a cavalier advancing at a rapid pace. St. Luc grew pale. "'Let us fly,' said Jean. "'Yes, let us fly, for there is a plume on that hat which disquiets me. It is of a color much in vogue at the court, and he looks to me like an ambassador from our royal master.' But to fly was easier to say than to do. The trees grew so thickly that it was impossible to ride through them but slowly, and the soil was so sandy that the horses sank into it at every step. The cavalier gained upon them rapidly, and soon they heard his voice crying, "'Hey, monsieur, do not run away. I bring you something you have lost.' "'What does he say?' asked Jean. "'He says we have lost something.' "'Hey, monsieur!' cried the unknown again. You left a bracelet in the hotel at Corville, Diable, a lady's portrait, above all, that of Madame de Cosset. For the sake of that dear mamma, do not run away. I know that voice, said St. Luke. And then he speaks of my mother. It is Bussy. The Comte de Bussy, our friend. And they reined up their horses. Good morning, madame said Bussy, laughing and giving her the bracelet. "'Have you come from the king to arrest us?' "'No, ma foi. I am not sufficiently in his majesty's friends for such a mission. No, I have found your bracelet at the hotel, which showed me that you preceded me on my way.' "'Then,' said St. Luc, "'it is chance which brings you on our path.' "'Chance, or rather providence.' Every remaining shadow of suspicion vanished before the sincere smile and bright eyes of the handsome speaker. "'Then you are traveling?' asked Jean. "'I am. But not like us.' 
Unhappily, no. I mean, in disgrace? Where are you going? Toward Angers, and you? We also. Ah, I should envy your happiness if envy were not so vile. Eh, Monsieur de Bussy, marry, and you will be as happy as we are, said Jean. It is so easy to be happy when you are loved. Ah, madame, everyone is not so fortunate as you. But you, the universal favorite. To be loved by everyone is as though you were loved by no one, madame. Well, let me marry you, and you will know the happiness you deny. I do not deny the happiness, only that it does not exist for me. Shall I marry you? If you marry me according to your taste, no. If according to mine, yes. Are you in love with a woman whom you cannot marry? Comte, said Bussy, beg your wife not to plunge daggers into my heart. Take care, Bussy. You will make me think it is with her you are in love. If it were so, you will confess at least that I am a lover not much to be feared. True, said St. Luc, remembering how Bussy had brought him his wife. But confess your heart is occupied. I avow it. By a love or by a caprice? asked Jeanne. By a passion, madame. I will cure you. I do not believe it. I will marry you. Mm, I doubt it. And I will make you as happy as you ought to be. Alas, madame, my only happiness now is to be unhappy. I am very determined. And I also. Well, will you accompany us? Where are you going? To the Chateau of Maridor. The blood mounted to the cheeks of Bussy, and then he grew so pale that his secret would certainly have been betrayed had not Jeanne been looking at her husband with a smile. Bussy therefore had time to recover himself, and said, uh, Where is that? It is the property of one of my best friends. One of your best friends? And are they at home? Doubtless, said Jeanne, who was completely ignorant of the events of the last two months. But... Have you never heard of the Baron de Maridor, one of the richest noblemen in France, and of... Of what? Of his daughter Diana, the most beautiful girl possible. Bussy was filled with astonishment, asking himself by what singular happiness he had found on the road people to talk to him of Diana de Maridor, to echo the only thought which he had in his mind. Is this castle far off, madame? asked he. "'About seven leagues, and we shall sleep there to-night. "'You will come, will you not?' "'Yes, madame.' "'Come. "'That is already a step toward the happiness I promised you.' "'And the baron, what sort of man is he?' "'A perfect gentleman, a preux chevalier, "'who, had he lived in King Arthur's time, "'would have had a place at his round table.' "'And,' said Bussy, steadying his voice, "'to whom is his daughter married?' Diana married. Would that be extraordinary? Of course not. Uh, only I should have been the first to hear of it. Bussy could not repress a sigh. Then, said he, you expect to find Mademoiselle de Meridor at the chateau with her father? We trust so. They rode on a long time in silence, and at last Jeanne cried. Ah! There are the turrets of the castle! Look, Monsieur de Bussy, through that great leafless wood which in a month will be so beautiful, do you not see the roof? Yes, said Bussy, with an emotion which astonished himself. And is that the chateau of Maridor? And he thought of the poor prisoner shut up in the Rue Saint Antoine. End of chapter 22. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Twenty Three of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Twenty Three: The Old Man. Two hours after they reached the castle, 
Bussy had been debating within himself whether or not to confide to his friends what he knew about Diana. But there was much that he could tell to no one, and he feared their questions. And besides, he wished to enter Meridor as a stranger. Madame de St. Luc was surprised when the report sounded his horn to announce a visit that Diana did not run as usual to meet them, but instead of her appeared an old man bent and leaning on a stick, and his white hair flying in the wind. He crossed the drawbridge, followed by two great dogs, and when he drew quite near said in a feeble voice, "'Who is there, and who does a poor old man the honor to visit him?' "'It is I, Signor Augustin,' cried the laughing voice of a young woman. But the baron raised his head slowly, said, "'You? I do not see. Who is it?' "'Ah, oh, mon Dieu!' cried Jean. "'You do not know me? It is true, my disguise.' "'Excuse me,' said the old man, "'but I can see little. The eyes of old men are not made for weeping. And if they weep too much, the tears burn them.' "'But must I tell you my name? I am Madame de St. Luc.' "'I do not know you.' Ah, but my maiden name was Jeanne de cosse Brissac. Ah, mon Dieu! cried the old man, trying to open the gate with his trembling hands. Jeanne, who did not understand this strange reception, still attributed it only to his declining faculties. But seeing that he remembered her, jumped off her horse to embrace him. But as she did so, she felt his cheek wet with tears. Come, said the old man, turning towards the house without even noticing the others. The chateau had a strange, sad look. All the blinds were down, and no one was visible. "'Is Diana unfortunately not at home?' asked Jean. The old man stopped, and looked at her with an almost terrified expression. "'Diana?' said he. At this name the two dogs uttered a mournful howl. "'Diana?' repeated the old man. Do you not then know? And his voice, trembling before, was extinguished in a sob. But what has happened? cried Jean, clasping her hands. Diana is dead, cried the old man with a torrent of tears. Dead? cried Jean, growing as pale as death. Dead, thought Bussy. Then he has let him also think her dead. Poor old man! How he will bless me some day! Dead! cried the old man again. They killed her! Ah! my dear baron! cried Jean, bursting into tears and throwing her arms around the old man's neck. But, said he at last, though desolate and empty, the old house is none the less hospitable. Enter! Jean took the old man's arm, and they went into the dining hall, where he sunk into his armchair. At last he said, "'You said you were married. Which is your husband?' Monsieur de St. Luc advanced and bowed to the old man, who tried to smile as he saluted him. Then, turning to Bussy, said, "'And this gentleman?' "'He is our friend, Monsieur Louis de Clermont, Comte de Bussy d'Amboise, gentlemen of monsieur le duc d'anjou at these words the old man started up threw a withering glance at bussy and then sank back with a groan what is it said jeanne does the baron know you monsieur de bussy asked saint luc it is the first time i ever had the honor of seeing monsieur de meridor said bussy who alone understood the effect which the name of the Duc d'Anjou had produced on the old man. "'Ah! You, a gentleman of the Duc d'Anjou!' cried the baron. "'Of that monster! That demon! And you dare to avow it and have the audacity to present yourself here!' "'Is he mad?' asked St. Luc of his wife. "'Grief must have turned his brain,' replied she in terror. "'Yes, that monster!' cried he again. "'The assassin who killed my child! "'Ah, uh, you do not know,' continued he, taking Jean's hands. 
but the duke killed my diana my child he killed her tears stood in bussy's eyes and jeanne said seigneur were it so which i do not understand you cannot accuse monsieur de bussy of this dreadful crime he who is the most noble and generous gentleman living see my good father he weeps with us would he have come had he known how you would receive him oh dear baron tell us how this catastrophe happened then you did not know said the old man to bussy eh mon dieu no cried jeanne we n none of us knew my diana is dead and her best friend did not know it oh it is true i wrote to no one it seemed to me that everything must die with her well this prince this disgrace to france saw my diana and finding her so beautiful had her carried away to his castle of Beaugier to dishonor her but diana my noble and sainted diana chose death instead she threw herself from the window into the lake and they found nothing but her veil floating on the surface and the old man finished with a burst of sobs which overwhelmed all oh comte cried saint luc you must abandon this infamous prince a noble heart like yours cannot remain friendly to a ravisher and an assassin but Bussy, instead of replying to this, advanced to Monsieur de Meridor. Monsieur le Baron, said he, will you grant me the honor of a private interview? Listen to Monsieur de Bussy, dear seigneur, said Jeanne. You will see that he is good and may help you. Speak, Monsieur, said the Baron, trembling. Bussy turned to St. Luc and his wife and said, Will you permit me? The young couple went out, and then Bussy said, Monsieur le Baron, you have accused the prince whom I serve in terms which force me to ask for an explanation. Do not mistake the sense in which I speak. It is with the most profound sympathy and the most earnest desire to soften your griefs that I beg of you to recount to me the details of this dreadful event. Are you sure all hope is lost? Monsieur, I had once a moment's hope a noble gentleman monsieur de monsoreau loved my poor daughter and interested himself for her monsieur de monsoreau well what was his conduct in all this ah generous for diana had refused his hand he was the first to tell me of the infamous projects of the duke he showed me how to baffle them, only asking if he succeeded for her hand. I gave my consent with joy, but, alas, it was useless. He arrived too late. My poor Diana had saved herself by d death. And since then, what have you heard of him? it is a month ago and the poor gentleman has not dared to appear before me having failed in his generous design well monsieur said bussy i am charged by the duc d'anjou to bring you to paris where his highness desires to speak to you i cried the baron i see this man and what can the murderer have to say to me who knows to justify himself perhaps no monsieur de bussy no i will not go to paris it would be too far away from where my child lies in her cold bed monsieur le baron said bussy firmly i have come expressly to take you to paris and it is my duty to do so well i will go cried the old man trembling with anger but woe to those who bring me the king will hear me or if he will not i will appeal to all the gentlemen of france yes monsieur de bussy i will accompany you and i monsieur le baron said bussy taking his hand recommend to you the patience and calm dignity of a christian nobleman god is merciful to noble hearts 
and you know not what he reserves for you. I beg you also, while waiting for that day, not to count me among your enemies, for you do not know what I will do for you. Till tomorrow, then, Baron, and early in the morning we will set off. I consent, replied the old Baron, moved by Bussy's tone and words. But meanwhile, friend or enemy, you are my guest, and I will show you to your room. End of chapter 23. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 24 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 24. How Remy Le Hadouin had, in Bussy's absence, established a communication with the Rue Saint Antoine. Monsieur and Madame de Saint Luc could hardly recover from their surprise. Bussy, holding secret interviews with Monsieur de Meridor and then setting off with him for Paris, appearing to take the lead in a matter which at first seemed strange and unknown to him, was to the young people an inexplicable phenomenon. In the morning the baron took leave of his guests, begging them to remain in the castle. Before Bussy left, however, he whispered a few words to Madame de St. Luc, which brought the color to her cheeks and smiles to her eyes. It was a long way from Meridor to Paris, especially for the old baron, covered with wounds from all his battles, and for his old horse, whom he called Jarnac. Bussy studied earnestly during the journey to find his way to the heart of the old man by his care and attentions, and without doubt he succeeded, for on the sixth morning as they arrived at Paris, Monsieur de Meridor said, "'It is singular, Count, but I feel less unquiet at the end than at the beginning of my journey.' Two more hours, Monsieur le Baron, and you shall have judged me as I deserve.' "'Where are we going?' to the louvre let me first take you to my hotel that you may refresh yourself a little and be fit to see the person to whom i am leading you the count's people had been very much alarmed at his long absence for he had set off without telling anyone but remy thus their delight on seeing him again was great and they all crowded round him with joyous exclamations he thanked them and then said now assist this gentleman to dismount and remember that i look upon him with more respect than a prince when monsieur de meridor had been shown to his room and had had some refreshment he asked if they should set out soon baron and be easy it will be a happiness for you as well as for us you speak in a language which i do not understand bussy smiled and left the room to seek remy well dear hippocrates said he is there anything new nothing all goes well then the husband has not returned yes he has but without success it seems there is a father who is expected to turn up to make the denouement good said bussy but how do you know all of this why monseigneur as your absence made my position a sinecure I thought I would try to make some little use of my time, so I took some books and a sword to a little room which I hired at the corner of the Rue Saint Antoine, from whence I could see the house that you know. Very good. But as I feared, if I were constantly watching to pass for a spy, I thought it better to fall in love. In love? Yes, oh yes, desperately, with Gertrude she is a fine girl only two inches taller than myself and who recounts capitally recounts yes through her i know all that passes with her mistress i thought you might not dislike to have communications with the house remy you are a good genius whom chance or rather providence has placed in my way then you are received in the house last night i made my entrance on the points of my toes by the door you know and how did you manage it quite naturally the day after you left i waited at my door till the lady of my thoughts came out to buy provisions which she does every morning she recognized me uttered a cry and ran away then then i ran after her but could hardly catch her for she runs fast but still petticoats are always a little in the way mon dieu cried she 
holy virgin said i the doctor the charming housekeeper she smiled but said you are mistaken monsieur i do not know you but i know you i replied and for the last three days i have lived but for you and i adore you so much that i no longer live in the rue Beaultrayi. but at the corner of this street and i changed my lodging only to see you pass in and out so that you are now as happy as a lover can be with gertrude does she suspect you come from me oh no how should the poor doctor know a great lord like monsieur de bussy no i said and how is your young master what young master the one i cured he is not my master oh i thought as he was in your mistress's bed oh no poor young man we have only seen him once since do you know his name oh yes he is the seigneur de bussy what the brave bussy yes himself and your mistress oh she is married yes but she still may think sometimes of a handsome young man when she has seen him lying wounded in her bed oh to be frank i do not say she does not think of him we talk of him very often what do you say about him i asked i recount all i hear about his prowess and i have even taught her a little song about him which she sings constantly bussy pressed the young man's hand he felt supremely happy end of chapter twenty four recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter twenty five of chicot the jester by alexander dumas this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 25. The Father and Daughter. On descending into the court, Monsieur de Meridor found a fresh horse, which Bussy had had prepared for him. Another waited for Bussy, and attended by Remy, they started. As they went along, the baron could not but ask himself by what strange confidence he had accompanied, almost blindly, the friend of the prince to whom he owed all his misfortunes. Would it not have been better to have braved the Duc d'Anjou, and, instead of following Bussy where it pleased him to lead, to have gone at once to the Louvre and thrown himself at the feet of the king? What could the prince say to him? How could he console him? Could soft words heal his wound? When they stopped? What, said the baron, does the Duc d'Anjou live in this humble house? Not exactly, monsieur, but if it is not his dwelling it is that of a lady whom he has loved a cloud passed over the face of the old gentleman monsieur said he we provincials are not used to the easy manners of paris they annoy us it seems to me that if the duc d'anjou wishes to see the baron de matador it ought to be at his palace and not at the house of one of his mistresses come come baron said Bussy, with his smile, which always carried conviction with it. Do not hazard false conjectures. On my honor, the lady who you are going to see is perfectly virtuous and worthy in all respects. Who is she, then? She is the wife of a friend of yours. Really? But then, monsieur, why did you say the duke loved her? Because I always speak truth, but enter and you shall see accomplished all i have promised you take care i wept for my child and you said console yourself monsieur the mercy of god is great to promise me a consolation to my grief was almost to promise me a miracle enter monsieur said bussy with his bright smile bussy went in first and running up to gertrude said go and tell madame de monsoreau that monsieur de bussy is here and desires to speak to her but continued he in a low voice not a word of the person who accompanies me madame de monsoreau said the old man in astonishment but as he feebly mounted the staircase he heard the voice of diana crying monsieur de bussy gertrude oh let him come in that voice cried the baron stopping oh 
mon dieu mon dieu at that moment as the baron tremblingly held on to the banister and looked around him he saw at the top of the staircase diana smiling and more beautiful than ever at this sight the old man uttered a cry and would have fallen had he not caught hold of bussy who stood by him diana alive diana oh my god mon dieu monsieur de bussy cried diana running down what is the matter with my father he thought you dead madame and he wept as a father must weep for a daughter like you how cried diana and no one undeceived him no one no cried the old man recovering a little no one not even monsieur de bussy ungrateful said bussy oh yes you are right for this moment repays me for all my griefs oh diana my diana my beloved diana cried he drawing his daughter to him with one hand and extending the other to bussy but all at once he cried but you said i was to see madame de Montsoreau. where is she alas my father cried diana bussy summoned up all his strength monsieur de Montsoreau is your son-in-law he said what my son-in-law and every one even you diana left me in ignorance i feared to write my father he said my letters would fall into the hands of the prince besides i thought you knew all but why all these strange mysteries ah yes my father why did monsieur de Montsoreau let you think me dead and not let you know i was his wife the baron overwhelmed looked from bussy to diana monsieur de Montsoreau, my son-in-law stammered he that cannot astonish you father did you not order me to marry him yes if he saved you well he did save me said diana sinking on to a chair not from misfortune but from shame then why did he let me think you dead i who wept for you so bitterly why did he let me die of despair when a single word would have restored me oh there is some hidden mystery cried diana my father you will not leave me again monsieur de bussy you will protect us alas madame it belongs to me no more to enter into your family secrets seeing the strange maneuvers of your husband i wish to bring you a defender you have your father i retire he is right said the old man sadly monsieur de Montsoreau feared the duc d'anjou and so does monsieur de bussy diana cast a glance at the young man he smiled and said monsieur le baron excuse i beg the singular question i am about to ask and you also madame for i wish to serve you monsieur le baron ask madame de Montsoreau if she be happy in the marriage which she has contracted in obedience to your orders diana burst into tears for her only answer the eyes of the baron filled also for he begun to fear that his friendship for monsieur de Montsoreau had tended to make his daughter unhappy now said bussy is it true that you voluntarily promised him your daughter's hand yes if he saved her and he did save her then monsieur i need not ask if you mean to keep your promise it is a law for all and above all for gentlemen you know that monsieur de bussy my daughter must be his ah cried diana would i were dead madame said bussy you see i was right and that i can do no more here monsieur le baron gives you to monsieur de Montsoreau, and you yourself promise to marry him when you should see your father again safe and well ah oh, you tear my heart monsieur de bussy cried diana approaching the young man my father does not know that i fear this man 
that I hate him. My father sees in him only my savior, and I think him my murderer. Diana, Diana, cried the baron, he saved you. Yes, cried Bussy, but if the danger were less great than you thought, what do we know? There is some mystery in all this, which I must clear up, but I protest to you that if I had had the happiness to be in the place of Monsieur de Montsoreau, I would have saved your young and beautiful daughter without exacting a price for it. He loved her, said Monsieur de Meridor, trying to excuse him. And I, then, cried Bussy, and although he stopped, frightened at what he was about to say, Diana heard and understood. Well, cried she, reddening, my brother, my friend, can you do nothing for me? But the Duc d'Anjou, said the baron. I am not aware of those who fear the anger of princes, said Bussy, and besides, I believe the danger lies not with him, but with Monsieur de Montserrat. But if the Duke learns that Diana is alive, all is lost. I see, said Bussy, you believe Monsieur de Montsoreau more than me. Say no more, you refuse my aid. Throw yourself then into the arms of the man who has already so well merited your confidence. Adieu, Baron. Adieu, Madame. You will see me no more. Oh, cried Diana, taking his hand. Have you seen me waver for an instant? Have you ever seen me soften towards him? No, I beg you on my knees. Monsieur de Bussy, do not abandon me. Bussy seized her hands, and all his anger melted away like snow before the sun. Then be it, madam, said he, I accept the mission, and in three days, for I must have time to go to Chartres to the prince, you shall see me again. Then in a low tone to her he said, We are allied against this Montsoreau. Remember that it was not he who brought you back to your father, and be faithful to me. End of chapter 25. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 26 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 26. How Brother Gorenflot awoke and the reception he met with at his convent. Chicot, after seeing with pleasure that Gorenflot still slept soundly, told Monsieur Boutromet to retire and to take the light with him, charging him not to say anything of his absence. Now Monsieur Boutromet, having remarked that, in all transactions between the monk and Chicot, it was the latter who paid, had a great deal of consideration for him, and promised all he wished. Then, by the light of the fire which still smoldered, he wrapped Gorenflot once more in his frock which he accomplished without eliciting any other signs of wakefulness than a few grunts, and afterwards making a pillow of the tablecloth and napkins, lay down to sleep by his side. Daylight, when it came, succeeded in at last awakening Gorenflot, who sat up and began to look about him at the remains of their last night's repast, and at Chicot, who, although also awake, lay pretending to snore while in reality he watched. "'Broad daylight,' said the monk. "'Corbleu!' I must have passed the night here. And the abbey! Oh, dear! How happy he is to sleep thus!" cried he, looking at Chicot. Ah! He is not in my position! And he sighed. Shall I wake him to ask for advice? No, no, he will laugh at me. I can surely invent a falsehood without him. But whatever I invent, it will be hard to escape punishment. It is not so much the imprisonment. It is the bread and water, I mind. Ah! If I had but some money to bribe the brother jailer!" Chicot, hearing this, adroitly slipped his purse from his pocket and put it under him. This precaution was not useless, for Gorenflot, who had been looking about him, now approached his friend softly and murmuring, "'Were he awake, he would not refuse me a crown. But his sleep is sacred, and I will take it.' Advanced, and began feeling his pockets. "'It is singular,' said he nothing in his pockets ah in his hat perhaps while he searched there chicot adroitly emptied out his money and stuffed the empty purse into his breeches pocket nothing in the hat said the monk ah i forgot and thrusting his hand 
He drew from the pocket the empty purse. "'Mon Dieu!' cried he. "'Empty! And who will pay the bill?' This thought terrified him so much that he got up and made instantly for the door, through which he quickly disappeared. As he approached the convent, his fears grew strong, and seeing a concourse of monks standing talking on the threshold, he felt inclined to fly. But some of them approached to meet him. He knew flight was hopeless and resigned himself. The monks seemed at first to hesitate to speak to him, but at last one said, "'Poor dear brother!' Gorenflot sighed and raised his eyes to heaven. "'You know the prior waits for you?' "'Ah, mon Dieu!' "'Oh, yes. He ordered that you should be brought to him as soon as you came in.' "'I feared it,' said Gorenflot. And more dead than alive, he entered the convent whose doors closed on him. They led him to the prior. Gornflow did not dare to raise his eyes, finding himself alone with his justly irritated superior. "'Ah, it is you at last,' said the abbey. "'Reverend sir, what anxiety you have given me!' "'You are too good, my father,' said Gornflow, astonished at this indulgent tone. "'You feared to come in after the scene of last night?' "'I confess it.' "'Ah, dear brother!' You have been very imprudent. Uh, let me explain, father. There is no need of explanations, your sally. Oh, so much the better, thought Gorenflot. I understand it perfectly. A moment of enthusiasm carried you away. Enthusiasm is a holy virtue, but virtues exaggerated become almost vices, and the most honorable sentiments, when carried to excess, are reprehensible. "'Pardon, my father,' said Gorenflot timidly, "'but I do not understand. "'Of what sally do you speak?' "'Of yours last night.' "'Out of the convent?' "'No, in it. "'I'm as good a Catholic as you, "'but your audacity frightened me.' "'Gorenflot was puzzled. "'Was I audacious?' asked he. "'More than that, rash.' "'Alas!' You must pardon me, my father. I will endeavor to correct myself. Yes, but meanwhile I fear the consequences for you and for all of us. Had it passed among ourselves, it would have been nothing. How it, is it known to others? Doubtless. You know well there were more than a hundred laymen listening to your discourse. My discourse? said Gorenflot, more and more astonished. I allow it was fine, and that the universal applause must have carried you on, but to propose to make a procession through the streets of Paris, with a helmet on your head and a partisan on your shoulder, appealing to all good Catholics, was rather too strong, you will allow. Gorenflot looked bewildered. Now, continued the prior, this religious fervor which burns so strongly in your heart will injure you in Paris. I wish you therefore to go and expend it in the provinces. "'An exile!' cried Gorenflot. "'If you remain here, much worse may happen to you, my dear brother.' "'What?' "'Perpetual imprisonment or even death.' Gorenflot grew frightfully pale. He could not understand how he had incurred all this by getting tipsy in an inn and passing the night out of the convent. "'By submitting to this temporary exile, my dear brother,' Not only will you escape this danger, but you will plant the banner of our faith in the provinces, where such words are less dangerous than here, under the eyes of the king. Set off at once, then, brother. Perhaps the archers are already out to arrest you. The archers? I, said Gorenflot. I advise you to go at once. It is easy to say go, but how am I to live? Oh, nothing more easy. You will find plenty of partisans who will let you want for nothing, but go in heaven's name and do not come back till you are sent for. And the prior, after embracing him, pushed him to the door. There he found all the community waiting for him to touch his hands or his robe. Adieu, said one, embracing him. You are a holy man. Do not forget me in your prayers. I, a holy man, thought Gorenflot. Adieu, brave champion of the faith, said another. Adieu, martyr, said a third. The light will soon come. Thus he was conducted to the outside of the convent, 
and as he went away he exclaimed, "'Devil take me, but either they are all mad or I am!' End of chapter 26 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 27 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 27. How Brother Gorenflow remained convinced that he was a somnambulist, and bitterly deplored this infirmity. Until the day when this unmerited persecution fell on Brother Gorenflow, he had led a contemplative and easy life, diverting himself on occasions at the Corne d'Abondance, when he had gained a little money from the faithful. He was one of those monks for whom the world began at the prior of the convent and finished at the cook, and now he was sent forth to seek for adventures. He had no money, so that when out of Paris, and he heard eleven o'clock, the time for dinner at the convent, strike, he sat down in dejection. His first idea was to return to the convent and ask to be put in confinement instead of being sent into exile, and even to submit to the discipline provided they would ensure him his repasts. His next was more reasonable. He would go to the Corne d'Abondance, send for Chicot, explain to him the lamentable situation into which he had helped to bring him, and obtain aid from his generous friend. He was sitting absorbed in these reflections when he heard the sound of a horse's feet approaching. In great fear, he hid behind a tree until the traveler should have passed. But a new idea struck him. He would endeavor to obtain some money for his dinner. So he approached tremblingly and said, Monsieur, if five patera and five aves for the success of your projects would be agreeable to you gorenflot cried the cavalier monsieur chicot where the devil are you going i do not know and you oh i am going straight before me very far till i stop but you what are you doing outside the barriers alas monsieur chicot I am proscribed," said Gorenflot with an enormous sigh. What? Proscribed, I tell you. My brothers reject me from their bosom. I am anathematized, excommunicated. Bah! What for? Listen, Monsieur Chicot, you will not believe me, perhaps, but I do not know. Perhaps you were met last night gadding about? Do not joke. You know quite well what I was doing last night. Yes, from eight till ten, but not from ten till three. How, from ten till three? Yes, at ten you went out. I? Yes, and I asked you where you were going. And what did I say? That you were going to pronounce a discourse. Mm, there was some truth in that, murmured Gorenflow yes and you even told me part of it it was very long and there were terrible things against the king in it bah so terrible that i should not wonder if you were arrested for them monsieur chicot you opened my eyes did i seem quite awake when i spoke i must say you seemed very strange you looked like a man who talks in his sleep yet i feel sure i awoke this morning at the corner d'abondance well of course you came in again at three o'clock i know you left the door open and made me cold is it true then true ask monsieur boutromet monsieur boutromet yes he opened to you on your return and you were so full of pride when you came in that i said to you fie compere pride does not become mortals more especially monks and of what was i proud of the success of your discourse had met with, and the compliments paid to you by the Duc de Guise and Monsieur de Mayenne. Now I understand all. That is lucky. Then you confess you went to the assembly, what did you call it? Oh, the Holy Union. Gornflow groaned. I am a somnambulist, he said. What does that mean? It means that with me mind is stronger than matter so that while the body sleeps, the spirit wakes and sometimes is so powerful that it forces the body to obey. 
Ah, come, Pana, that sounds like magic. If you are possessed, tell me so frankly, for, really, a man who walks and makes discourses in his sleep, in which he attacks the king, is not natural. Vare retro, Satanus! Then, cried Gorenflot, you abandon me also? Ah, I could not have believed that of you. Chicot took pity on him. What did you tell me just now? said he. I do not know. I feel half mad, and my stomach is empty. You spoke of traveling. Yes, the holy prior sends me. Where to? Wherever I like. I also am traveling, and will take you with me. Gorenflot looked bewildered. Well, do you accept? continued Chicot. Accept? I should think so. But have you money to travel with? Look, said Chicot, drawing out his purse. Gorenflot jumped for joy. How much? said he. One hundred and fifty pistoles. And where are we going? You shall see. When shall we breakfast? Immediately. What shall I ride? Not my horse, you would kill it. Then what must I do? Nothing more simple. I will buy you an ass. You are my benefactor, Monsieur Chicot. Let the ass be strong. Now, where do we breakfast? Here, look over this door and read. Gorenflot looked up and saw. Here, eggs, ham, eel pies, and white wine may be had. At this sight, Gorenflot's whole face expanded with joy. Now, said Chicot, go and get your breakfast while I go and look for an ass for you. End of chapter 27. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 28 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 28. How Brother Gorenflot traveled upon an ass named Panurga and learned many things he did not know before. What made Chicot so indifferent to his own repast was that he had already breakfasted plentifully. Therefore he sat Gorenflot down to eggs and bacon while he went among the peasants to look for an ass. He found a pacific creature, four years old and something between an ass and a horse, gave twenty-two livres for it, and brought it to Gorenflot, who was enchanted at the sight of it, and christened it Panurga. Chicot, seeing by the look of the table that there would be no cruelty in staying his companion's repast, said, Come, now we must go on. At Meloon we will lunch. Gorenflot got up, merely saying, At Meloon, at Meloon. They went on for about four leagues, then Gorenflot lay down on the grass to sleep, while Chicot began to calculate. One hundred and twenty leagues at ten leagues a day would take twelve days. It was as much as he could reasonably expect from the combined forces of a monk and an ass. But Chicot shook his head. It will not do, he said. If he wants to follow me, he must do fifteen. He pushed the monk to wake him, who, opening his eyes, said, Are we at Meloon? I am hungry. Not yet, compere. And that is why I woke you. We must get on. We go too slow. Ventre de biche. Oh, no, dear Chicot, it is so fatiguing to go so fast. Besides, there is no hurry. Am I not traveling for the propagation of the faith, and you for pleasure? Well, the slower we go, the better the faith will be propagated, and the more you will amuse yourself. My advice is to stay some days at Meloon, where they make excellent eel pies. What do you say, Monsieur Chicot? I say that my opinion is to go as fast as possible, not to lunch at Meloon, but only to sup at Montereau, to make up for lost time. Gornflow looked at his companion as if he did not understand. Come, let us get on, said Chicot. The monk sat still and groaned. If you wish to stay behind and travel at your ease, you are welcome. No, no, cried Gorenflow in terror. No, no, Monsieur Chicot. I love you too much to leave you. Then to your saddle at once. Gorenflow got on his ass, this time sideways, as a lady sits, saying it was more comfortable, 
but the fact was that, fearing they were to go faster, he wished to be able to hold on by both mane and tail. Chicot began to trot, and the ass followed. The first moments were terrible for Gorenflot, but he managed to keep his seat. From time to time Chicot stood up in his stirrups and looked forward, then, not seeing what he looked for, redoubled his speed. "'What are you looking for, dear Monsieur Chicot?' "'Nothing, but we are not getting on.' "'Not getting on? We are trotting all the way.' "'Gallop, then,' and he began to canter. Panurge again followed. Gorenflot was in agonies. "'Oh, Monsieur Chicot,' said he, as soon as he could speak, "'do you call this traveling for pleasure? It does not amuse me at all.' "'On, on!' "'It is dreadful!' stay behind then panurga can do no more he is stopping then adieu compadre gorenflot felt half inclined to reply in the same manner but he remembered that the horse whom he felt ready to curse bore on his back a man with a hundred and fifty pistoles in his pocket so he resigned himself and beat his ass to make him gallop once more i shall kill my poor panurga cried he dolefully, thinking to move Chicot. "'Well, kill him,' said Chicot quietly, "'and we will buy another.' All at once Chicot, on arriving at the top of a hill, reined in his horse suddenly, but the ass, having once taken it into his head to gallop, was not so easily stopped, and Gornflow was forced to let himself slide off and hang on to the donkey with all his weight before he could stop him. "'Ah, oh, Monsieur Chicot!' cried he. What does it all mean? First we must gallop, fit to break our necks, and then we must stop short here. Chicot had hidden himself behind a rock, and was eagerly watching three men who, about two hundred yards in advance, were traveling on quietly on their mules, and he did not reply. I am tired and hungry, continued Gorenflot angrily. And so am I, said Chicot, and at the first hotel we come, we will order a couple of fricasseed chickens, some ham, and a jug of their best wine. Really? Is it true this time? I promise you, compere. Well, then, let us go and seek it. Come, Panurga, you shall have some dinner. Chicot remounted his horse, and Gorenflow led his ass. The much-desired inn soon appeared, but, to the surprise of Gorenflow, Chicot caused him to make a detour and passed round the back. At the front door were standing the three travelers. End of chapter 28. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.